our investigation into the uh, chronological timeline of Jesus' ministry here on earth takes a, a turn tonight as he begins to focus more on his death, burial, and resurrection. As we continue along in this study, we'll see him from this point on talking more and more about his uh, upcoming death, burial, and resurrection. So to set the timeline and, and to set the pattern and foundation for our message, let's look at uh, Matthew chapter 16, uh, beginning our reading with verse 21, and we'll see exactly where we uh, get this uh, turn from. In Matthew chapter 16, verse 21, he says, From this time Jesus began to show his disciples. Now this time is right after his confession, Peter's confession that he is the Christ, the Son of the living God, and Jesus saying, Upon this revelation I will build my church. From that time on, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and chief priests and scribes, and be killed and raised the third day. Then Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him, saying, Far be it from you, Lord, this shall not happen to you. But Jesus turned and said to Peter, Get behind me, Satan. You are an offense to me, for you are not mindful of the things of God, but of the things of men. Let's pray. Father, with these few words we begin looking tonight, at uh, the turn in Jesus' ministry as he begins now to look more uh, towards his uh, death, burial, and resurrection, as he begins to teach more and uh, deliver the message to the, his disciples and others. Help us as we continue our journey uh, this evening to find not only the chronological activities of Jesus, but more importantly, to find those things that are applicable to us, those things in his ministry that we can apply to our own lives and help us in our daily lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. As we look at this, we want to look first at uh, the teaching that he gives to us of his death. He goes on in uh, this passage, and he's talking about his death. He's talking about his future suffering in verse 21. From this time on, he began to show the things that uh, he must suffer uh, and the place that he is to suffer these things is Jerusalem. It says in here that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things. Now that's significant because Jesus knew the place. Many times we don't know where we're going to suffer, whether it's going to be at work or in our neighborhood, in the church where we attend, or in some other venue where we may find ourselves. We don't know, but Jesus knew exactly where he was going to have to go and where he was going to suffer. Uh, it was in Jerusalem, and that's significant because over in John chapter 11, when Jesus is getting ready to go to Lazarus, he's just been told that Lazarus, his friend, is sick. Lazarus lived in Bethany just over the hill uh, from Jerusalem. You cross down the Kidron Valley up the Mount of Olives and over into Bethany, it was a very easy walk or, or short walk uh, from Jerusalem. So Jesus was getting ready to go to Jerusalem in John uh, chapter 11 uh, after he had learned, two days after he had learned that uh, Lazarus was sick. And the disciples said, are you going to go to that place? Don't, don't you remember the last time you were there, they wanted to stone you to death and you're going back? In other words, they were trying to keep him from going to Jerusalem. Later in that passage, Jesus confirms that he's going one way or the other, and Thomas says, then we'll go with you. Uh, we'll follow you. Wherever you go, we'll go with you, even if it means to death. They didn't understand that Jesus had to go to Jerusalem. This was his appointment. This was where he was to suffer. Even though he had told them clearly in this time that he must go to Jerusalem where he would suffer. And the people that would be involved in that are the people that should have known better. The elders, the scribes, and the priests. These people who dealt with the scriptures all the time, who looked at the word, who were looking for the Messiah to come, these were the ones that should have known what the prophecy said 
and how he lined up with all of the prophecies. But they missed it. I think the same could be said for us today. There are a lot of things that are lining up in the scriptures and we miss it. We just totally miss it. And we keep asking the question, are we living in the end times? Are we living in the end times? Are we living in the end times? Well, the Bible tells us what the end times are going to look like. And so we ought to be able to look into the word and discover for ourselves whether or not we're living in the end times. Now, I'm not a date setter, and I'm not going to set any kind of dates and say that this is going to happen at such and such a time. But I do believe that when you look at the Word of God and the way he describes the end times, that we are living very close to the end times. Now, whether we're in the last chapter or we have two or three more chapters to go or several more chapters, I don't know. No one knows but the Father in heaven. But I do believe we're getting close to the end of the book. And I believe that from having studied God's word. He had to go to Jerusalem, and he had to suffer many things from the priests, the scribes, and the elders that should have known better. And the purpose for which he was going was to suffer and die. He says here that he must be killed and raised the third day. Here he's telling them that I'll be put to death, but I'll rise back to life on the third day. That didn't catch in their minds until after he had risen and they remembered him saying that and began to believe after they saw it. But they didn't catch it at the beginning because nobody had ever done that before. Nobody had ever died and then brought back to life on the third day on their own initiative. But Jesus said in John chapter 12, as he's talking to his disciples, he said, I did not come to judge the world. I came to save the world. He came for the purpose of dying. That was the reason he came to to die for our sins. Yes, he came to teach. He came to deliver a message of hope and encouragement. He came and healed. He came and did many good things. But the purpose for which he came was to die for our sins. And when he said it is finished on the cross, uh, that could apply to many things. It, uh, certainly our salvation was finished. He had paid the atoning price for our sins. And when he died on the cross, it is finished, meant that our salvation was finished. But it also meant that the reason for his coming in the first place was completed. The plan was finished. He had done what he had intended to do. And now he could go back to the Father. Well, when Peter heard this, Peter was always one to speak before he thought. And Peter spoke up in verse 22 and said and took Jesus aside. I don't think he did this in front of the whole crowd of, uh, of the disciples. He took him aside and he began to rebuke him. He began to charge him. He began to say things to him to say, no, Lord, this isn't right. You're not going to die. We won't allow that to happen. Far be it from you, Lord, this shall not happen. Many times we try to help God out, don't we? Many times we misunderstand what God is trying to do in our lives and the lives of those we love. Many times we blame God because of the sin in the earth and, and the things that are happening. We look at loved ones who've died of COVID or friends who've died of COVID, and we say, how can there be a merciful God? We look at people in faraway countries that are are being slaughtered by opposing governments. And we say, how can God there be a merciful God when these children are being uh, murdered or when starvation comes in, when the, the crops are not producing? It all goes back, my friend, to sin. God's heart is broken when we sin. God's heart is broken when he sees his children suffering. And it's not that God can't do, it's that God has 
been restricted from doing some of the things that he wants to do because of sin. There, there is a consequence of sin. When man partook of the, the fruit of the tree that God told him not to eat of, that was a choice that brought in the sin nature into life and into our people. And because of that, death came by sin. The earth began to be deteriorate. Up to that point, people lived much longer. After that point, their lifespan began to shorten. The work was much harder because of sin. The one thing we don't want to factor into this uh, easy believism is that sin, it's man's choice. And yes, sin affects God's people. And I've had those in my family, those that I love, those that I care for, church members that I've had to bury that have broken my heart. I wasn't ready for them to go and to, to die. They were, they were tremendous, godly people, but they died. Am I bitter at God? No. Because death is the doorway through which we go from this sinful, restrictive life to the ultimate eternal life that God has prepared for us. And death is a door. In a few moments, I will go out the door of this room and continue on with my activities for the day. And that door does not provide me any fear or trepidation. I don't fear opening that door for what's on the other side because I pretty well know what's on the other side. The same is true with death. I don't fear death because I know what's on the other side. It's Jesus and the place that he's prepared for me. So when we come to all these problems and trials and difficulties in, in life, remember it's sin that has tainted our world. And one of these days God's going to put it all right. There's going to be a new heaven and a new earth without the presence of sin. But right now we deal with that. And Jesus came and dealt the blow to Satan on the cross that began the process of overcoming this sin. Now it's taken several years because his, his, his blood atoned for our sins. It put our sins under the cross, under the blood. He saved us, but we have to receive the gift. You can have a gift sitting under the Christmas tree for years and years and years and never be claimed by the individual. That's the way it is with salvation. God has given us the gift of eternal life, but we have to receive it. We have to ask Jesus Christ to come into our heart and life. He did that on the cross, and he rebuked uh, Peter for this, a rebuke and rebuttal when he said, when uh, Peter said, not so, my Lord, Jesus said, you are an instrument of Satan, Peter. You don't understand. You're trying to circumvent the plan and will of God. I think we try to do that sometimes, too. We try to take the easy way. We try to help God out and do things our own way and then ask God to bless our initiatives and it doesn't work that way we need to seek god's direction and follow his will we like peter can get in the way of god's plan and god's purpose for our life if we're not careful he goes on in this passage and he talks about the cost of being a disciple he's talked to peter and he says peter you don't understand if you're going to follow me you've got to take up your cross and follow me he says in verse 24 You've got to deny yourself. There is that denial that has to come in. What is denial? It is that total, completely disowning of ourself. I have no right to control my life. People say, well, I have a right to. No. Not if Jesus is Lord. If Jesus is Lord, then I have surrendered the reins to him and said, okay, Lord, what do you want? There are times that I may want to do one thing, and God says, no, I want you to do something else. And in my <clears throat> life and ministry, I have found that when I have surrendered to God and his leadership in my life, things have gone a whole lot better than what I might have wanted. 
and what I would have desired and, and the path that I would have taken would have led me into great difficulties. There comes a time and we have to say, Lord, what do you want? Because you see, if I say to him, no, Lord, <laughs> that's an oxymoron. I can't say that because the moment I say no, he ceases to be Lord and I become Lord of my life. He ceases to be Lord. The only response that I can give to him is, yes, Lord. You say, well, that's, that's servitude. No, that's a love relationship because I know that what he wants for me is best. And I surrender. I die to myself. I deny myself and die to self so that he might live. And he goes on and says that idea of death of self-will self in uh, verse uh, 24 and 25. We must deny ourselves and take up our cross and follow him. For whoever uh, will save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake shall find it. For what profit is it if a man gains the whole world and loses his own soul? You can gain the whole world, my friend, as far as financial wealth. You can gain the whole world as, as far as prestige and power. But if you lose your own soul, what profit is it? It's, it's like the rich man that uh, died and uh, went to hell. And he had all of these great riches and he fared sumptuously while on earth. But when he died and went to hell, <clears throat> He lifted up his eyes and being in torment and he said, Abraham, just send Lazarus and let him dip his finger in some water and touch it to my tongue. Give me a little bit of relief. Abraham said, that's not possible. You had your reward on earth. Now Lazarus is getting his reward. You see, it's not about the money we possess. It's not about the prestige we have and all the things and toys we possess. And Jesus said to his disciples, there is going to be a time of discovery. In verse 27, he said these words, the son of man will come in glory. Number one, he's coming back again. He, he's going away for a time, but he's coming in glory with his angels and they will give rewards to those who have been faithful. There is a time of rewarding that uh, Bema seat judgment of Jesus when he rewards those who have been faithful to him. But there's also that peek into the future when he says, assuredly, I say to you, verse 28, that no, there are some who are standing here who will not taste death until they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. In just a moment, we're going to see that, I believe. I believe Jesus was talking about what was about to happen as he gave a peek into the future, into the kingdom Christ, into what he was going to be. And this doesn't mean that he was telling those disciples that all of them, uh, that some of them would still be alive when he came back the second time. Uh, he hasn't done that yet. But he was telling them that some of them would see his glory. Now, I think the two areas that we see that in, num number one is the transfiguration and also uh, at the uh, ascension when he went up into the heavens and the angel said, while you're looking up, this same Jesus is coming back. They saw a bit of that glory and, and that uh, specialness of Jesus, if you please. Well, let's look at chapter 17 now in the book of Matthew and see the transfiguration uh, that took place. In the transfiguration, there is the people, the, the participants. Jesus, uh, verse 1, was there, of course. And he took that inner circle of his, Peter, James, and John, with him up to a high mountain where he was transfigured. Now, the word transfigured is that word for metamorphosis. And the Greek word is very similar to that word. Uh, the word that we get metamorphosis. It's very interesting. Uh, a few weeks ago, my grandson came home with a special little container from school. 
they had had a special presentation about the transformation of caterpillars into butterflies. And he had gotten one of these little uh, containers with a caterpillar in there and uh, some food. And we watched as that caterpillar began to eat that food. And then all of a sudden he stopped eating and began to build a cocoon. We watched as he stopped the eating and built this cocoon, fashioned this cocoon that he placed himself in. Every day we would come in and we would bend down and we would look at that container and that little caterpillar up there at the top of that container. One morning we went in there and saw the caterpillar. We came home that afternoon and the caterpillar was gone. But in its place was a painted lady butterfly. That caterpillar had been transformed, transfigured, metamorphosized. That's what he's talking about here. Jesus was changing his person, his nature, in this moment before their eyes. The participants were Jesus, Peter, James, and John. And verse 3, it says, also, it was Elijah and Moses. There's been a lot of speculation as why Moses and Elijah. Some, some have said because Elijah never died. Uh, he was translated into heaven. But Moses died, uh, and, and God buried him. We have that record in the Scripture. But I believe that these two are there because Moses represented the law. God gave the law to Moses. And Elijah represented the prophets, one of the great prophets that lived. And these were, <coughs> were the two areas that the Old Testament related to, the law and the prophets. And they were there with Jesus, the law and the prophets. Jesus came to fulfill the law. The prophets looked forward to Jesus coming, and they were there in this time. And as they were standing there, G, uh, Peter made a proposal. Here we go again with Peter. Talking before he really thinks about what he's saying, perhaps. Verse 3, uh, they see Moses and Elijah there with Jesus. And Peter said to them, Lord, it is good that we are here. Wow. And one of the things that we notice they knew who Peter, uh, who Elijah and Moses were. They didn't need to be introduced. Jesus nowhere in here says, guys, I want you to in be introduced to Moses, and I want you to be introduced here to, to Elijah. They knew who was there. Because Peter says, let's make one uh, tablet, uh, a tabernacle for you, and one for Moses, and one for Elijah. He knew who they were. And this was close to the Feast of Tabernacles. And, and Peter was saying, it's good that we are here. Let's just stay here for a while. And we'll build three tabernacles. And we'll spend some time with you and spend some time with Moses and spend some time with Elijah. And we'll spend the, this time together in the tabernacles. And as he was speaking, he got the validation. As Peter was talking, the voice came from heaven that says, this is my beloved son. Listen to him. It was kind of a rebuke for Peter to say, listen, Peter, you see Moses, you see Elijah, but Jesus is the one you need to be listening to. You listen to him. And my friend, I think the same thing could be said for us today. We need to be listening to what Jesus says in his word and what Jesus has said in his word and not be listening to all these other people who are talking about Jesus. People who are talking about the ways they think you can get to heaven. Jesus said, I'm telling you how to get to heaven. Come through me. That's what we need to be focusing on, what Jesus said, not what everybody else says about him. And when they got that validation, they fell on their face. In verse 6, when they heard the voice, they fell on their face in fear, greatly afraid. But then Jesus comes with that personalization again. 
in verse 7, Jesus came to them and touched them and told them not to be afraid, to get up and not be afraid. See, my friend, whatever we fear, whatever our greatest fear is, whether it's something physical or whether it's something uh, in our minds or, or something that uh, we just have a phobia about, Jesus said, don't worry. I'll take care of you. I'm there for you. Jesus touched each one of them personally and said, get up. Don't be afraid. And when they looked up, they saw no one save Jesus only. I love that verse. They saw no one save Jesus only. Verse 8. That's what we need to keep our eyes on. Regardless of what happens around us, to us, in the political realm, financial realm, grocery store, economically, whatever, keep our eyes on Jesus. Don't allow the things of the world to overwhelm you. Keep your focus on Jesus and serving him faithfully. And he'll help us through all of these difficulties. I'm not saying there's not going to be difficulties ahead for us. But he will help us as we put our faith and our trust in him. He always has. And he always will. You see, my friend, the lesson we learn from his teaching on his death, burial, and resurrection, and the transfiguration, the cost of discipleship, is simply this. The cross is the pivotal point of our faith. It all revolves around the cross. What we do with the cross makes all the difference in the world. If we embrace the cross and accept it for ourselves and accept it as Jesus' gift to us as we accept him and say, your death on the cross paid the atonement for my sins and I'm trusting you, that makes all the difference in the world. Then if we say, no, thank you. The cross is too difficult. The cross is too hard. I need to do something myself. I, I'll take. I'll handle this myself. When we reject the cross and we reject the Lord Jesus Christ, my friend, we're on our own. We've made a choice. Unfortunately, it's the wrong one. Don't try to go it alone. Don't try to be macho and and do it your way. Because usually our way, in fact, always our way is wrong. God's way is the best way. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face, allowing the things of this world to grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. Would you pray with me? Father, help us in these moments to do just that. To shut out the world, the things of the world, and to yield our heart and life to you. Say, Lord Jesus, I admit that I'm a sinner. I know you died on the cross to save me from my sins. And right now I call upon you to do just that. To save me. I give you the leadership and the lordship of my life. Take me and use me for your glory and honor. In Jesus' name we pray. If you pray that prayer, then he'll do it tonight. I pray. And you will find the peace you need through Jesus Christ our Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless you.